Shalom. Welcome to the Lights of the Nations. We are studying Maimonides, the Rambam, Hilchot Beit HaBachira, Laws of the Chosen House, chapter number 5. And as we have emphasized time and time again, this is nothing less than a workshop in not only the preparation of building the temple, but the building of the temple, because in order for us to be prepared and in order for us to be focused on the time of rebuilding, the positive commandment of rebuilding in our own time, we must be fluent with the blueprint, the plan for the Beit HaMikdash, and that is precisely what the great Maimonides has done for us in this tremendous work, structured order, and physical plan really for building the temple. So in this chapter so far, we have been discussing the structure of the Temple Mount, we've been discussing the layout, and we started with the outer walls, we started talking about the courtyard and the gates, we came to the Soreg in our last lesson, the low fence or, or wall, and now we're f going further in, and we already mentioned the Chel, which is, according to Maimonides, actually it is the wall that surrounds the court of the temple itself, the court of the temple meaning the court of Israel and the court of the priests, Ezrat Yisrael and Ezrat Kohanim. And in Halacha Dalid, the Rambam begins by telling us, Lifnim min hachel ha'azara. Inwards from the chel is the court itself. And v'chol ha'azara ha'yeta kuf pei zayin al rochav kuf lamed hei. The measurement of the azara was 180 seven amot long and 135 amot wide vishiva sha'arim hayula and this area of the temple known as the azara the court had seven gates so first of all regarding this measurement that we mentioned 187 by 135 of course we find like many other details that the rambam lists here this is based on the mishnah in tractates Midot, actually here we're talking about um, chapter 5 and the first Mishnah in tractate Midot. And of course this is the inner dimension, the inner measurement of the Azara. It does not include the thickness of the walls itself. Uh, as an interesting side point, Azara, this name, the courts, actually if we see that it's very closely related to Ezra, to help, to aid, the word for help in Hebrew. And in fact, one of our commentators points out that this actually, the name of the court of the temple, Azara, actually comes from the word Ezra, help. And in this case, of course, a reference to divine aid, the God who helps his people in times of trouble. This is actually... Um, Specifically, the reference that's made is to a verse in Psalms. It's in Psalms chapter 46 and verse 2, where we see this word used regarding Hashem's helping His people in times of travail. So, since Israel gathers together in the temple to pray to their Creator for divine aid and are answered, the name of the courtyard itself reflects this concept of gathering there to pray for divine intervention. So, again, the Rambam tells us here that there are seven gates to the Azara. This, too, is based on Mishnayot Midot. And in this case, we're talking about the fourth Mishnah of the first chapter of Midot. And, and uh, we have this description of seven gates. Now, there is also um, something that we have to mention here. There is another Mishnah in Tractate Midot that indicates that there are 13 gates. And in general, this concept of the exact amount of gates in the Azara, it's a bit strange. At this point, we have to point that out. Now that the Rambam has, t has told us here that there are seven gates, this is a problematic statement, actually, because there are three Mishnayot in Tractate Midot that mention the number of gates to the Azara, the temple courtyard, one Mishnah tells us that uh, there are five gates. 
there's another Mishnah that tells us there are seven gates. And there's another Mishnah that tells us that there are 13 gates. So not only is this an issue of the Rambam contradicting Mishnayot Midot, but worse than that, it seems that there is a contradiction internally in Tractate Midot itself, because we have one Mishnah, for example, that tells us regarding the Levitical guard. There is a concept that we're going to be learning about later, that the Levites have a positive commandment to stand guard. It's an honor guard. It's not against um, infiltration of robbers, but it's a type of showing honor to the king of the universe by standing guard at the gates of the temple. They were told to stand guard at 21 particular places. And five of those are at the five gates of the temple courtyard. Then there's another Mishnah that um, and that's the one that we're referring to here, that we've referred to here so far, and that's the one that tells us there were seven gates to the temple courtyard. But then there is another Mishnah which refers to the 13 prostrations that were uh, done when people would come to the temple and bow down. And there is an opinion that's expressed by one Abba Yossi ben Hanan, who declares that these 13 prostrations were instituted because of 13 gates. So now here is a very good example of a type of situation for Torah scholars to actually um, enjoy, I could say. In other words, this is a, a very typical type of situation for those that are accustomed to the ways of the oral tradition and the whole idea of how things are derived according to the system of principles for expositing the Torah, which has been handed down in every generation from the Sinai revelation itself. In other words, there are certain principles of how apparent contradictions within the text, not only of the written Torah, but the oral Torah, also have to be worked out. It's impossible for there to be a contradiction within the same tractate regarding the number the number of gates. Furthermore, this would seem to smack of a certain kind of 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 conundrum that we find in in uh, Talmud study, which is referred to as a machloket b'mitziut. That means that the, that the argument the 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 uh, divergence of verses amongst the sages seems to be about a situation which could be easily proven because it's just the reality of the situation. In other words, it's, a, it's about a fact, a proven fact. How could there be a contradiction, not only in the same tractate, but about how many gates there were? Either there were so many, so many gates or there weren't. There can't be an argument about something which is not theoretical, but about which something, something which can certainly be proved by eyewitness testimony and by, and by uh, physical uh, demonstration. So basically the, the way of interpreting this, this uh, apparent conundrum which is the most accessible and the most feasible for our point of study at the moment, the explanation is that our sages of blessed memory are not disagreeing about the number of gates because that would be this problem of a machloket b'mitziyot, of, of a disagreement about, about a, uh, a solid factual situation. There can't be a disagreement about that because it can just be proven. So they're not disagreeing about the number of gates, entrances to the temple courtyard, but the question that's being debated is about which of these entrances are called entrances. And this is actually a very beautiful idea and typical of the type of logic which is employed by our great sages in their deep understanding of Torah principles and in, in principles of halakha that were given over to Moshe. In other words, one of the beautiful things about Torah study, the more that we experience is we realize that the Torah itself has general and basic and specific principles regarding everything. And in these situations, there is no room for personal opinion, emotion, or or a particular um, a personal agenda or feeling. The idea is what does the Torah consider um, a reality to be? 
this is why we have, for example, in, the, in, in Jewish law, based on the Torah, of course, I should say, in Torah law, we have concepts such as weights and measures um, when we deal with issues regarding um, uh, foods that are prohibited, for example, or, or this type of thing. There are certain measurements, and those measurements determine, according to the principles of our sages, which are the principles of the Torah itself, they, these, those measures de determine what the Torah itself considers to be the amount of food that has to be eaten in order for it to be considered that you've consumed anything at all. In other words, there are principles which bring about a certain kind of uniformity to the experiential side. And that uniformity is, is reflected by hal a halachic norm. So too, in our particular situation, the issue is not how many entrances there were physically, let's say that there was the largest number, let's say that there were 13 gates. The issue is, which of them have the din of being a gate? That means, which of those entrances are legally considered to possess the criteria for being a gate? What does that mean? Before I, I explain, I'll just give you another example, okay? Everybody knows that a doorpost, a doorway in a home, a doorpost, requires a mezuzah. Based on the verse in Deuteronomy 6, and here we're working within the same framework of an entrance. So there is a halachic principle, which is based on the verse in Deuteronomy 6, where Hashem instructs us that we have to place these words on the doorposts of our houses and upon our gates. So, according to Torah law, a door has a very specific definition. It has the mezuzah, it has the doorpost, it has the lintel, and the mezuzah is supposed to be affixed on the doorpost. Now, there are situations in homes and in buildings where there are passageways, hallways, entrances, tunnels that are certainly used as entrances, but that don't necessarily require a mezuzah, or they don't require a blessing to, to be recited on the fixing that mezuzah because that door is not really considered to be halachically a doorway. It may require a mezuzah, but it is not a good example of a doorway. And therefore, because maybe there's a certain degree of, of doubt as to whether or not it's qualified, so maybe it should be placed there without a blessing, all sorts of different circumstances. This is as an example that you might have an entrance that isn't necessarily considered to be a proper doorway. And there is something that we can all identify with because this has everyday ramifications in halacha for Jews all over the world who want to affix mezuzot. So too, let's say that there are 13 entrances from the courtyard, but they're not all considered to have the legal entity as far as Hashem is concerned of a doorway because there are certain circumstances, there are certain factors, criteria regarding these gates in the temple and two things specifically come to mind. One is, as we have very, as very briefly alluded to, there is a commandment for the Levites to have a watch in the gates of the temple. But the guards, the Levitical guards, were only required to stand watch over those gates that are considered to be gates. Another aspect of jurisprudence regarding the entity of the gate would be regarding a person who is impure, tame, or as some people say, ritually impure, is prohibited from entering into the temple. And if he does, then he inadvertently enters into the temple in a state of impurity, he must bring a certain type of offering. But the question is, would he be considered, would he have to bring that offering if he, can, if he came into a gate that is not considered a gate? So that essentially, in a nutshell, is the, is the way our sages explain this contradiction within Tractate Midot, and certainly the way the Rambam understands this concept, the seven entrances that we are about to mention now into the courtyard of the temple are the seven entrances which have every aspect of the identity, according to Torah law, of a gate. And other entrances may in fact be passages, but they don't, they're not considered to be gates as far as practical application like the Levitical watch. So,
continuing, the Rambam tells us about these seven gates. Gimel min ha-tzafon ha-smuchin l'ma'arav. V'gimel min ha-darom smuchin l'ma'arav. There are three gates on the northern side of the temple courtyard, the Azara, which are closer to the west. We'll see what that means in a moment. That's the language of the Rambam. And there are three gates from the south, also closer to the west, ve'echad b'mizrach, and one on the east, mechuvan keneged beit kodesh ha'kodashim be'emtza. And the gate on the eastern side of the Azara is directly opposite the Holy of Holies in the center. So, this too we find in the second chapter of Tractate Midot, the regarding the northern gates, the southern gates, and the concept here that the Rambam tells us that they are close to the west means that they are drawn closer to the western end than to the east. In other words, they're not exactly on the north and on the south, not exactly even, not exactly in the middle of the wall, but rather they are towards the western side. And of course we have recorded the names of these gates in the time of the Second Temple. We have the northern gates that were referred to as the Gate of the Spark. This is Shar HaNitzotz, Shar HaKorban, the Gate of the Offering, Vishar Beit HaMoked, and the Gate of the Chamber of the Hearth. And what are these gates? These gates on the um, northern side we're going to start with the gates that we just mentioned the, the gate of the spark the gate of the offering and the gate of the chamber of the hearth these, these are the three gates on the northern side and we have our illustrations of these gates the gate of the spark is actually a two floor structure and it has an entrance to the chel the gate of the offerings, we'll see later from where the gate of the spark takes its name. The gate of the offerings actually is called so because there are actually many offerings that are brought in the temple of varying degrees of sanctity. And this in itself is an exact science, understanding the different levels of significance of every single one of the korbanot, the offerings that are brought in the temple. This is actually something that until this moment we haven't really touched upon at all in this particular series of the Rambam. But the gate of the offering takes its name in that the, off the most offerings of the highest order of sanctity, the highest level of, of holiness, were actually prepared, slaughtered on the northern side of the courtyard and were brought into the area of the altar through this particular gate. The gate of the chamber of the hearth, I'm going to leave off the definition <clears throat> of what the chamber of the hearth is all about at this point simply because a little further on in this chapter we're going to be discussing that in great detail. And the Rambam tells us again there are three gates on the southern side also towards the western end and those gates are referred to as the gates of fuel. That's called Shar HaDelek, Shar HaBechorot, the gate of the firstborn, and Shar HaMayim, the gate of water. And all of these functions in the temple, what specifically their design was and from where they received their name is something that we're going to be looking at a little bit later in great detail. Lastly, again, the Rambam tells us one on the eastern side, exactly opposites the eastern gates. That, of course, is a reference to Shar Nikanor. In the Second Temple, this is called Shar Nikanor. It's on the eastern side of the temple facing the Holy of Holies in the exact center. And it is the Nikanor gates, which, unlike all of the other doors in the temple that we have already mentioned and learned about, other doors in the temple were plated with gold. The Nicanor gates were plated with copper. And of course, it's these gates that divide between the women's court, the Ezrat Nashim, 
and the courts of Israel, and it's these gates at which the two sides of these gates are found, the small wickets which we have previously discussed. Now, the Nicanor gates were very, very impressive, and later on in history, even when the financial situation of Israel was much stronger and much of the temple was inlaid and overlaid with gold as in fact is a reflection of the commandment that we learned very early on in the Rambam about how if the congregation can afford it the temple should be beautified very very much even so these gates were always kept of copper and that actually our sages record is because of a great miracle that occurred originally with a man named Nicanor and in, and in, and in uh, memory or in commemoration of the great miracle that was wrought those gates were always kept out of copper and <clears throat> what is this tradition the great gates of Nicanor that we are told about Nicanor was a, a very noble person who donated these gates to the Holy Temple and this tradition actually comes from Tractate Yoma that this Nicanor was a Jew who traveled, journeyed all the way to Alexandria, which at that time was a great center of art and craftsmanship, and he commissioned these beautiful gates to be made. And they were fashioned there, and then he set sail with them on a boat to return to the land of Israel. According to the story, there was a very violent storm at sea and the vessel was threatened with being capsized. And after other measures failed, the crew on the ship determined that they had to uh, dump something overboard, they had to jettison some of the cargo so that the weight would be reduced, and they tossed one of these heavy doors into the sea. And uh, the danger did not cease. The ship was still uh, in, in great peril of being wrecked and the crew wanted to cast the second gate as well into the sea and Nicanor hearing this said that they might as well throw him overboard also he was so totally stricken with remorse at the loss of that great gate he said you know I have no purpose to my life anymore just throw me overboard also after he made that statement the sea calmed and everything was okay and the rest of the journey of course Nicanor was totally overcome as to why this should happen, as to why uh, he hadn't uh, been able to save the first gates. And according to the story, as the Talmud tells us, when the ship finally docked in the land of Israel, the gates that had been thrown off the ship way back in uh, the port in Egypt um, had been floating along with the ship all all the way and was uh, was um, emerged from underneath the ship and they were able to um, bring it and he brought the two gates to the temple. So our sages tell us that even later when the financial situation of the people of Israel improved and all of the temple's gates were replaced with gates of gold, still Nicanor's gates remained uh, in the original to commemorate this uh, miracle and they also comment that these gates shined as if they were made out of gold. There is also another alternative uh, tradition regarding Nicanor. There was another Nicanor who was totally different, not the Nicanor of, uh, of this fame, who was a wonderful man who donated these doors to the temple. There was a, a Nicanor who was a officer in the Greek army in the story of Hanukkah, the time of the Hashmonaim, and he was very, very evil and acted very contemptuously and with great uh, malice against the Holy Temple. And finally, on a particular day, it was the 13th of Adar, the Maccabees, the Hashmonaim, were successful in subduing him, and they finally caught him, and in fact, he was killed, and which in itself they considered to be a very great miracle. And according to one particular tradition, his hands were cut off and suspended above these gates in a great commemoration of the miracle of the downfall of this very wicked man who had terrible designs against the people of Israel. This is another uh, concept which is associated with the name Nicanor and the 13th of Adar in fact is recorded in, 
in uh, one of our sources as having been a holiday in the time of the temple to commemorate the downfall of that wicked man. So this is, until now, we have seen going further in from the Chel now, the gates leading into the courtyard of the temple. Again, our plan following the blueprints, giving us a perspective of every concept of the temple, leading us to the time of rebuilding, the time of the dwelling of the Divine Presence, the light to Israel, and the light to the nations. Dedications are available for upcoming Light to the Nations teachings. To make a dedication, simply click on the dedication link below the video. Dedications can be made either by check or by credit card via our online form. Add your personal dedication and pick your preferred date. Your dedication will appear as you have designated. In addition, you will receive a personal DVD copy of the show. Your dedications make these productions possible.